Welcome to, to Mulder Church. Good morning. We are kicking off our Flex series on the, the person of Samson this morning. And um, if you have your Bibles, you can get those out and turn to Judges chapter 13. When, when I was in high school, I, I played football, or to be, to be more fair, I was on the football team, okay? Um, I was not an amazing athlete. Uh, I was pretty scrawny for a football player. It didn't help that I went to a big high school, but I'm not here to give excuses, okay? Um, I, I wasn't that great. Some might say that I was a bench warmer, and the truth is that I wasn't even good enough to sit on the bench because in football, the bench is actually the place where the good players sit to get rest in between series. So uh, when the offense was on the field, the defense needed the benches to sit down and go over their game plans and, and just the opposite. So, so my job was to stay off the bench, don't drink the good player's water, and just really my job was making sure that I was dressed warm enough on the sidelines due to my own inactivity. Okay, We, we, had, uh, we had some talent on our team. We didn't have anybody who's, who's playing in the league right now or anything like that, but we had some talent. Um, in fact, uh, you'll, you'll like this story. This is a true story. I, my junior year of high school, um, we, uh, we lost our, our head coach, and we were looking for a new head coach. And uh, a guy, a coach by the name of Gus Malzon, actually came to my high school and interviewed to, to coach as the head coach at my high school. And we had kind of heard about Gus a little bit. We would read in the newspaper about what his teams were doing and, and the records that they were setting, how many points they were putting on the scoreboard, how many yards his quarterbacks would throw for. His quarterback would throw for more yards in one game than we would see in like six or seven games. And so we were excited because we thought he's, he's going to bring that here and we need that. And, and so Gus comes to, uh, comes to some of us and he gets us to go out on the field and he wants us to, to run some, some patterns and some crossing routes and, some, and, and throw some passes. And somebody thought it was a good idea to take me out there as well. Um, and so we, we did this for about 30 or 40 minutes and, and I want to say that I actually had a pass hit me in the face and it like ricocheted off my face. So that was not a good start with the new potential coach. So after about 30 or 40 minutes, Gus uh, gets in his truck, he starts his ignition, and he drives off into the sunset, never to return to my hometown again. Now, to this day, when I think about Auburn's title run that they had in, in the Cam Newton year, and, and Gus was the, the OC, I think about how I feel a little responsible for that, because I saved Gus Malzon from the black hole that is coaching me. Okay, so you're welcome, Auburn fans, for that one. So back to, back to my gusless team. We, we had some talent. We had this one guy who was a year ahead of me, and he was, he was a stud. Uh, he was a defensive end. He was, about, he was about 6'3", a very quick, very fast 250. Okay, and I add quick and fast because some of us, we know 250, but it may not be a quick and fast 250. But he, he was quick, he was big, he could get off the line, he was strong, and he just, he just had a knack for getting to the quarterback, okay? Tackles for loss, fumbles, you name it, sacks. Um, but he had a reputation. He had a reputation for being lazy. Uh, because, and the way that he gained this reputation is that, is that every preseason, the time of the year where you, you sweat like none other, you, you have two-a-days, sometimes three-a-days when you can't get it right, um, all of those practices, he would be hobbled by just the slightest of injuries. Nothing major, but it was something that would sideline him, and he always managed to make it back and be ready the week of the opener. He was always ready to go, and he always played because he was good. He always played because he was good, and it was believed that with the right work ethic, he would be playing Division I somewhere. Okay, and, for, and so for me growing up in Arkansas, that meant playing on Saturdays in Fayetteville for the Razorbacks. Okay, and I know a lot of you are thinking, aren't they more of a Division II school at this stage of the game? Okay, it feels that way sometimes, all right? But, um, but a lot of people thought he's got the talent for it, he could do it if he put in the work. And so many of us, okay, including myself, so many of us were jealous of, of the size that he had, um, how, how big, how strong, how fast he was. And it didn't help either that he was just, 
he was a good looking dude and he was funny. Okay, and so if just hope that he didn't like your girlfriend, fellas. Okay, this is kind of one of those kind of guys, and and people, we were all just so jealous and, and wish we had some of that and wish we had the talent that he had. And, and most of us, we have been around people uh, like that, people that we know are talented, uh, people that we know we see what they have, we see the gifts and the blessings that they have, and we think, man, if if I had what they had. I would be, I would be so, so much more disciplined with it. I would be a better steward of it. I would be so much more grateful, so much, so much more thankful if, if I could do what they could do. Or maybe uh, some of you, jealousy and envy was never your problem, but you've seen people that are insanely talented, and, and you've even encouraged them. You've said, man, you, you've got this gift. You're just really good with people. You're really good at just organizing and, and, and sort of controlling this and running this. You, you just really have a knack for this. So, um, so we, we've seen people who are talented, and we've encouraged them. But if you've been alive long enough, we, we've seen people, we've known people who are so talented, but we've seen them squander it. We've seen them not quite live up to the potential that we thought that they should, right? And we, we've, so we've talked a little bit about athletics. You may see athletes who you, you think, man, if they would have been a little more disciplined, if they would have developed that talent a little more, they would be so much better. Or if they would have taken care of their bodies as they aged, they would have been so much better. And we can think of, of actors, we can think of musicians, we can think of comedians who are so talented, so gifted, have been able to use that talent, okay? Ha- have a, a prominent place uh, in, in the media, uh, on the spotlight. We've seen uh, their lives in prematurely because of, of depression. We've seen their lives in prematurely because of, of overdoses and addictions. And this is something that we've seen uh, for generations. Okay, we can, we can name across generations Judy Garland, Marilyn Monroe, Kurt Cobain, Robin Williams, Whitney Houston, Heath Ledger, the, the list goes on and on. The, these are people who were so talented whose, whose lives were shortened. Um, and, and we can think of others who maybe their life isn't over yet, but, but it may seem to us at least that their life could have been so much more. That they're not quite living into the potential that God has put in. That they're not, they're not living into that talent or that blessing that God has given them. And so um, people often have the same reaction when, when they read about the character of Samson in the book of Judges. Okay, Samson is, um, if, we, if you were a boy going to VBS and Samson was one of the stories, you wanted to experience the kind of strength that Samson had. Okay, even grown men to this day, I mean, what would it be like to be as strong as Samson is. And so we, we look at the person of Samson and we think, wow, there, there could be so much more there. Yeah, there, could, there could, he could have used his talent in, in so many more ways. And so in the book of Judges, um, God's people, we find God's people living life on sort of this cycle. Okay? They're living on this, this cycle, this repeat of we love God, we serve God, we want to worship him alone, and then That gets old for a little while. They start getting into something else. They start worshiping other gods, making sacrifices to other deities. All of a sudden, the one true God is now on the back burner. That gets them into some trouble. And then they say, God, we're sorry. Please help us. Will you save us? Will you forgive us? God bails them out and they love God again. And they just, they are in repeat. They're going, living this life over and over and over again. And the book of Judges takes place um, at a very interesting point in biblical history. It, it takes place just after some of the conquests of Moses and Joshua leading the people uh, into the promised land. And it happens just before the, the age of kings where we meet King Saul, we meet King David, we meet King Solomon. And so if we could, um, if we could sort of um, outline this a little bit and, and compare it to a, a child's development, um, Moses and, and Joshua leading into the promised land is sort of Israel coming into its infancy stage. That they are, they are finding their land, they are developing law, they are developing order, and, and the, the age of the kings is more of Israel growing into its adulthood, where it's becoming a, a more mature nation, it's taking its prominent place 
on the national stage as a world power. And so the best way I know to characterize the, the judges of Israel in the book of Judges is sort of that awkward preteen stage that we've all gone through. That stage where we have a lot of our permanent teeth, but we have some of our baby teeth as well. And so our smile it looks kind of goofy and doesn't look quite right. The acne has set in, right? We want the acne to go away. Our body is producing more amounts of BO than it ever has in its life. And your parents have purchased for you deodorant for you to wear, but you don't, you don't think you stink yet, but the truth is that you do, so you need to wear it. Okay, a personal experience. My dad finally had to tell me, Justin, you stink. Wear the speed stick, okay? So, personal experience. So that's the best way I know to characterize um, the, the children of Israel in the book of Judges, finding their identity, okay? Understanding what their identity is. And when you open to Judges chapter 13, we are given a diagnostic of, of God's children in Israel, okay? And it's the diagnostic is this in verse 1. And the people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. This is, this is a passage, this phrase is Again, on repeat, this is the seventh time this phrase is mentioned in the book of Judges. This phrase along with another phrase that is also on repeat that we see a lot in the book of Judges. It says in Judges 17.6, In those days, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This is important uh, to point out because the perception of the people is everything's fine. Like, me and God are good. Me and my neighbor, we're good. I'm doing what's right in, in my own eyes, and my behavior's acceptable. Everything is just fine. And the sad reality is, is that these two verses, these two passages are true at the exact same time. Okay? So while, while God sees what they're doing, that, this is, that they, this is evil in his sight, they are completely oblivious to it. They are completely oblivious. They think they are choosing good. They think that they are choosing what is right. And, and the truth is, is that most of us, most of us, don't wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm going to choose evil today. I'm going to choose to be evil today. Most of us don't think that way, but most of us do think, I'm going to do what I think is right. I'm going to do what seems right in my own eyes. And that doesn't always put us in the place that God wants us to be. And so, um, these two passages remind us uh, of a couple things. The first one, it reminds us of the definition of what sin is. It reminds us that sin is not simply violating our own conscience. Sin is not simply violating our own personal standards or the standards of a group. But rather, sin is... Uh, violating God's will for us, God's command for us, okay? So th this helps sort of re reorient us on what sin is, okay? So in addition to that, it, it reveals to us and it reminds us of the deception that sin has in our lives. It reminds us how easily deceived that we are, that God's people had a rationale for what they were doing. While they were rebelling against God, while they were living in sin, rather than, rather than rebuke one another, and try to pull each other back, they, they all thought, you know what, this, this seems like a good idea. Let's just go the other way. Let's just abandon God. And rather than iron sharpening iron, like Proverbs 27 says, they dulled one another. They, they became numb to the commands of God. They became numb to God's standard for their life. Okay, in a more modern example, we see this uh, just recently. We, we celebrated the 75th anniversary of the Normandy invasion. Um, Nazi Germany believed it was doing the world a, a moral good by exterminating the Jews. And, and that's, that's crazy for us to think about. It, it's hard for us to imagine that they actually thought that was a good idea. That they actually thought that, that this was a good thing, um, wiping out this group of people. But, but when we live apart from the Word of God, when we choose to live apart from the standards and the commands that God has for us, there's no limit to how far we can fall. There's no telling how depraved we could be um, at the end of that. And so we could even argue today that, that there, are, there are parts of our own southern culture 
that, that we do what we think is right in our own eyes. And it seems right to us, but there are things that we do that grieve the heart of God. Okay? And that's for another sermon, another time. So let's get back to, to Samson in Judges 13. And the people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. And so what God does is he gives them exactly what they want. They live their lives separate from him. He is going to give them a life without him. So when we pick up the story, we find God's people living in captivity under the impression of the Philistines. There is a man named Manoah who has a wife who is barren. And an angel of the Lord comes to his wife and tells her that though she is barren, she will conceive and bear a son. And the angel also tells her that he is to be a Nazarite from birth. Now, Nazarite, what does that mean? Um, this, is, this is a vow that you can read about in, in Numbers chapter 6. And it, it basically says this. The Nazarite vow is something that was intended to be temporary and voluntary. All right, um, You are to basically abstain from alcohol, abstain from cutting your hair, and abstain from any kind of contact with, with dead bodies, carcasses, that sort of thing. And most of the time when we think of fasting from something, we think of giving up something that, that we, we really like. And the first two I get, okay, sometimes, sometimes you just want to kick back when you're celebrating. You want to you sip on a Michelob Ultra or Old Milwaukee or a glass of wine or whatever your poison is. I get that. Um, I get the cutting the hair thing because we, you know, we like to, to look good. Okay, we like to get a haircut from time to time. Maybe we like to shave. Uh, some, maybe your lady likes for you to have the shaved face, makes you look younger. Okay? But the last one, I just, I just want to meet the guy. Maybe I don't want to meet the guy who just, just is antsy about getting after them bodies. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Like, maybe he's a psychopath, I don't know. But, uh, but these, these are the three vows that are laid out as the Nazarite vow. And, and while they are designed to be temporary and voluntary, the angel gives uh, this woman very specific instructions that Samson is to live this way his entire life, okay, from birth until his, his death. And so um, the angel of the, the Lord adds this in verse 5. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of of the Philistines. Before Samson was a grown man, we know Samson for his strength. Before he was a grown man, before he was doing butterfly curls, bicep curls, plyometric push-ups, just going through, you know, I don't know if he would be a crossfitter or not, but before Samson was doing all those things, before he was a child, before he was even born, before he was conceived, God gave him a purpose. God gave him a purpose. Before Samson could speak a word, God set him apart with a purpose. And, and as, we, as we go through the next couple weeks, you'll hear us talk about uh, the, the talent and the bless, the way God blessed Samson, as well as the many flaws that Samson has. Um, despite all that you read, despite all that you'll hear about Samson, is that you'll, you'll clearly see in the text that he was chosen by God, that he was given a purpose by God. Though he may be very flawed, he is very chosen. And the, the, whole, the whole pro-choice, uh, pro-life debate, uh, it's, it's, it has become so political that, that a lot of times, sometimes in churches, we, we're afraid to talk about it or we don't want to talk about it. But whenever we, we come, it's difficult to avoid when we come to passages like this, where we see God instill in, in a child um, a, a vision, a, a purpose, a destiny, whatever you want to call it, to place that in a child uh, before that child is ever born. Okay, and the same can be said in, in Jeremiah, um, in Jeremiah 1.5. He says to Jeremiah, God says, before I formed you in the womb, I, I knew you. Okay, before you were ever a substance, I knew you. Before, not, not, not after two weeks, not after six weeks, but far before that, I saw you and I knew you. And, and just as God knew Jeremiah, God knew you as well. 
God saw you as well. Uh, he, he thought about you. He planned for you. Even though maybe it seems like someone else didn't plan for you, God did. God was not surprised. Um, you were not unexpected by God. And, and I say this because there's a lot of times that we feel discouraged. There's a lot of times that we feel inadequate when it comes to God actually having a purpose for me. Like God actually thinking that I could do something. God actually thinking that I could live into something that he would want me to do. And, and I know that, that in this room there are people here that we, we do feel inadequate. We do feel like, yes, this is true. God has called me to a purpose. But, but along the way, we feel as if we have violated that. Along the way, we have, we have sinned deeply. Along the way, we have felt like we are not worthy of His grace, that we are not worthy of His mercy, that we are not worthy of His help, that we are not worthy of Him. But though we are very flawed, we are also very chosen. We are also very loved. And so while, while we read all of these things about these people whose births were set apart, whether it be Samson, whether it be Jeremiah, there, there's so many other people that, that fall into this category we have to remember that God knew us before we were ever in the womb. And that God has a purpose for you, and God has a purpose for me. And, and the Spirit of God is, is pressing us to find that purpose. The Spirit of God is moving us into that purpose. Okay, because that's what exactly what he did in the life of Samson. Okay, verse, verse 24, And the woman bore a son, and called his name Samson, and the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. I love that imagery because when you stir something, it changes everything. Okay? When you stir something, it changes the composition. I'm sure many of you, you've, you've, the ingredients say dump all this together, and it looks like this clumpy mess on top, and it looks like there's just going to be this big nasty hunk of something in whatever it is you're drinking. But when you stir it, it all comes together. It works together the way that it was designed to work. And so what we see God doing here is we see God pushing, okay, stirring, moving Samson into the purpose, into the direction that he has for his life. And so the good news for us today is that the same spirit that stirs Samson lives in us as believers who have put their faith in Christ. That God has put that purpose in us and, and God is moving us and stirring us to go in that direction, to live into that purpose. I want to I close with this. This is where I want to finish. And, and I hope this makes sense. Uh, I've been known to not make sense at times. So haven't we all? But, uh, but I read an article. Um, this was probably about a month ago. It was, it was very interesting. And, and it really got to um, I, the heart of the matter, I think. But I read an article about, uh, about millennials. And more than any of the other previous generations, millennials um, really are drawn to the concept of socialism. And, and a part of me is like, I, I wonder why that is. And I think at first glance you think, well, millennials have sort of a uh, you know, reputation for not wanting to work. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Um, millennials, maybe it's because they weren't alive during the fall of the Soviet Union. Could that be a thing? Maybe so. Um, but it actually goes much deeper than that um, because each generation for the past 60 to 70 years, and this, this doesn't just have to do with socialism, but it has to do with so many other governments, so I'm not trying to single it out. That's just what the article was about. But over the course of the past 60 to 70 years, generations have progressively gotten more and more secular and have, have walked away more and more towards the church, towards a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ, and so what happens is, when you find yourself, when, when there is a truth that there is a God that loves you, that made you, that has a plan for you, that sees you as um, at, with infinite worth, when you reject that, when that truth just becomes an idea, when that truth just becomes something that someone else believes, you're going to try to find your worth in something else. You're going to try to look for that worth in other places. And, and so what, what often happens, whether it's a, a socialist government or a capitalist government or whatever, we try to find our worth and value in other places. And we often do that with what we do. 
okay, with the jobs that we have, and what's the measurement of, of our success with our work? Money, right? Okay, and it doesn't take us very long to figure out that we all make different amounts. Okay, I could get online and look up Tom Brady's salary, his annual salary, and, and see, wow, he makes, he makes just a little bit more than I do as the youth pastor at Mulder Church. Like, just by, just by a little bit. But, but if that's where I'm finding my worth, then Tom Brady is far more valuable than I am as a person. That, that, God, that, that he is seen differently, and obviously he is because he, he's in the spotlight, but, but I would say that he is more of a human and I'm lesser of a human uh, because that is what I'm measuring. And again, um, despite whatever, whatever governments we're talking about, okay, capitalists are, are guilty of doing this as well, where we look to money, look to career as sort of this measuring stick rather than the truth that God knows us, God loves us, God has given us a purpose. And if you don't find it there, you're going to look for it somewhere else. If you don't find it there, you're going to look for it somewhere else. And so what is, what's true for Samson in being set apart? What's true for Jeremiah in, in being known by God and set apart uh, before his, his birth is that God has known you from the beginning. Okay? And your days were ordered by Him. Your worth is in that of his sons and his daughters. That we are sons and daughters of the king. And so my, my prayer for us today as, as we close is, is that this truth would bring us comfort. Okay, that, we could, that we could rest in this, that we could find peace in this, and, and that this truth would remind us that we are not a mistake and that God has a plan for our lives. God has a purpose for your life, whether you are seven or whether you are 97. That you are flawed, but you are chosen, and you are loved by the King.